He says, the Lord, what? Oh, my, my. I can jump right now, step on these old bad feet. <laughs> the Lord, look what he says now. The Lord is, what? My shepherd. My shepherd. It's a wonderful thing when we come to a place in our journey with God to say that he's mine. <laughs> he's mine. The Lord is my, now keep in mind, he's saying a duality. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, and if the Lord is my shepherd, then I must be what? I must be sheep, metaphorically. Did you know that sheep comes from what? Sheep originated from goats. Well, well Pastor Fraser, how, how is that? Some say that sheep originated from goats. So they were saying that it's a time they changed. Now, are you, Pastor Fraser, you're talking about evolution. Well, evolution only means progress. Now, I hope that uh, all of us have changed from uh, elder said love. <laughs> I thought or somebody said goat. <laughs> Can we say praise the Lord? Mm -hmm. So what the writer is trying to convey to us at this particular time that there is a correlation between the pastor and the, te and the teacher and the pastor and the sheep. Are you still with me? Are you still with me? The shepherd was responsible for the sheep. The sheep were so valuable that Jesus makes a epic statement by saying that one had 100 sheep and he left the 90 and nine and pursued the one. Isn't that something? Does that, does that sound, uh, Sensical to you that if you had a hundred sheep, you would leave 99 and run after one? Most folks do like this. You don't want to be going about your business. But the value that Jesus Christ placed upon the sheep, he gives reference of, at one's repentance that heaven itself rejoice. Isn't that something? I don't know if they shout like me or shout like you, but there was something jubilant about the process of repentance. And also keep in mind, when he says these four and one, uh oh, you may say five, Pastor Frazier, but pastor and teacher, there's a correlation there as well. What good is teaching if you don't have someone that's teachable? Hmm? Is it plausible or is it an inference for the teacher to expect a replication of what they have been taught? Jesus made a statement, I, I want you to grasp this. Jesus made a statement to that intimate group of uh, disciples that would have the task of changing the face of religiosity. He said, who do men say that I am? My, my, my. And you know what? They responded by just a few references. But they said a lot of hurtful things about Jesus. And the barbaric acts that was imposed upon him. Am I talking loud enough? Hmm? Some say that thou art John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say that thou art uh, liar. Some say that thou art another prophet. And Jesus let that go. And he said, who do you say that I am? Have we ever thought or digest, masticate, just chew, and, and wondered what Jesus was perhaps speaking to this intimate group that he had taught them?
as a teacher and now an instructor as an apprentice. Jesus did not want to leave terra firma until these individuals knew exactly who he was, what he came to do. Am I talking about it now? I've got to instill inside of you the task at hand. I've showed you, I've exposed to you every precept. I've taught you. Others I have spoken in, in parables. I have spoken in riddles. But I spoke to you plainly. I've showed you. And not only that, I have given you the authority, the power to replicate my ministry to the world. My God, my God, my God. Now tell me, who am I? Who am I? Now another thing that you want to understand, when you talk about Jesus, he has a dual personality, pardon me, not a personality, but he has a dual, dual what? Nature, nature, nature. And old Peter, there's always that big mouth. Sometimes he would talk before he thought. But we had the presence of mind. Thou art the Christ. Now notice he's saying now. You are the Messiah. Thou art the Christ of who? The living God. Is that right? You are the one that always existed. He didn't say the body. He just said you're the one that always existed. You're the eternal spirit. And that's how they saw him. When Jesus would uh, heal the sick and he would say certain things, he would constantly reveal himself. It was not only for the world, but it was for whom? It was for his disciples. Man was uh, paralyzed and he was in a bed. They let the bed down through the rafters and the Pharisees were there pompous religious bigots. They were there to catch Jesus saying something. They can accuse him of blaspheming, violating the traditions of men, which was approximately 613. Jesus said, thou sins be forgiven. <gasps> no one can forgive sin, but, but God. Jesus said, well, let me ask you something. What is it? <laughs> is, it, is it for me to say, take up your bed and walk off? <laughs> and what, what he was doing is revealing himself. And they did not take note of that. Not only that, but his disciples were still in a process of tutelage of learning up until the very day that he hung on the cross of Calvary between heaven and earth. It is up to us, my brothers and sisters, to get all that we can get and follow the principles of Jesus Christ that our lights shine because now since he has left, the light has gone, but we have now become the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So therefore, when we look very clearly at pastors, it has a profound connotation. It is one of respect, but you will never get the benefit of pastors. Your pastor's teaching tonight, all right? You'll never get the benefit of a pastor until you allow that one that God has sent you to be your pastor. Am I talking loud enough? Hmm? Are you still with me? Hmm? 
they never understood who Jesus was until Jesus began to speak with them. in Christian character. Oh, I have substantial information for that and grounds for it. You recall that when Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves and told them what to do a be. Isn't that ludicrous for somebody to speak to something like that and say be still? Hmm? But he spoke to the spirit that was behind the wind and the waves. He rebuked it and he disarmed them. He took the power and authority away from them. And to substantiate my point, his own disciples that had been with him for so long they looked at him and said, what? That came from the depths of their heart. What their eyes now have seen, what this man that we only know as rabbi and rabboni, just teacher, hear what I'm saying now, pastor, teacher, Jesus was a shepherd, the Bible says so. He was an apostle, the Bible says so. Pastor, teacher. Are you putting pats on yourself? Pat? No, not at all, God forbid. But they didn't recognize his authority, his power, who he was. They stood back in awe. Who has been with us all of this time and we did not understand who he was? Too many of us would go through life and never really understand and have the experience of Jesus Christ. Am I talking loud enough? Hmm? Some folks were pleased to just get a C in school. I just want, I just want enough to pass. I, I just, oh, I just want to make it to heaven. He saved you more than just to make it to heaven. My, my, my. Remember the talents? Let me leave that alone. I'm going to another place. So what happens is that now they understand through teaching and understanding who he was. Who he was. My God, my God, my God. What manner of man is this? Well, he was more than a man. My, my, my. Demon said, you've come to torment us before what? Before our time. Is that right? Jesus informed him, I am time. I am time. My God, my God, my God. Nobody takes my life. I lay it down and pick it up again. Isn't that something? He was trying to let them know that he was more than a mere man. They wanted to stone him. Jesus said, well, I tell you what. By what good works do you stone me? Well, you being a man, make yourself God. As Bishop, the late Bishop Bell would say, they, they would have been right by saying, being God, make yourself man. <laughs> Can't we say hallelujah? Jesus, Jesus took that intimate group and began to teach them. But there had to be an intimate relationship with their teacher. There had to be a hunger, not only just being around him, because we understand that in Gospel of John chapter 6, he had more than 12 disciples. Jesus made a statement. He said, that manna that came down from heaven, 
He said, you all think it was just, no, that manna was me. Now, how, how can you be the manna? Now, if that wasn't bad enough, he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He said, oh, now we're talking about cannibalism. It's not only enough to be around the shepherd, you have to understand the shepherd. And Jesus at various pivotal points in their ministry was trying to elevate them, to take them out of the concrete to the abstract. Can't we say praise the Lord? To, a, to use that spiritual mind to imagine what he can possibly do. And many times we're in the concrete. So he was the pastor and what else? Teacher. Teacher. Now at this particular point, what the apostle Paul is making the attempt to do to the church of Ephesus is to mature them. Am I talking loud enough? To make them perfect. Now, that word perfect, sometimes it, it kind of destroys us. And we are to be perfect, by the way. Be ye perfect, for I'm perfect. Is that right? Hmm? Can't we say praise the Lord again? Look at verse 12, if you will. For the perfecting of the saints. I read the above, particularly chapter uh, uh, 4 and verse 11. I'm taking some time with that. And it's for what? For what? It's for the perfecting of the saint. Now, note something. There was no debate. There was no uh, argument. There was no disagreement. In this writing of the Apostle Paul, that they were not saints. Saints being sanctified, being made holy, being made clean. They are inducted into the family of God by the processes of spiritual nativity. God has strategically placed them at a place so they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by hearing it, to repent, be baptized, and receive or become recipients, benefactors of the Holy Spirit by the evidence of speaking in tongues. They are in the church. They are bona fide, certified uh, saints. But they're not perfect. They're not perfect. Even Paul said, I press. I ain't got there yet, but I'm pressing. Hmm? Neither considered himself to be what? Perfect. Is that right? But what is Paul trying to say to this church? And his words speaks volumes, and they speak to us in 2024. For the perfecting of the saint. He's given what? He's given the gift. I certainly think we have consensus tonight to say uh, the affirmative that he has given the gift and that gift is the apostles. Is that right? Hmm? And that's plural. And the prophets, the evangelists, pastor, and teachers. Is that right? Let me further say this to you. That is the gift to the church. All of them. And it is for one particular purpose, and that is to perfect you. Well, if it's to perfect the saint, uh, Pastor Fraser, what perhaps does that mean, perfection? Perfection means two particular things. And you may agree, you may not. You may say, Pastor Fraser, that's simply an inference. But perfection means to be complete 
And it also means to be mature. We must come to a place of spiritual maturation. And let me say this to you as well. Let me throw this in here. Let me interject this. God, and I use those absolutes again, God can never use you until he transforms you. And so many folks are lost in transition. Perfecting. Paul says it makes a profound statement that supports this scripture. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, when I was what? When I was a child. Now we certainly know he's not talking about a chronological age. When I was unskillful, when I was at a place of learning, my cognitive abilities was not as they should be, my reasoning. I thought, is that right? Not at all. Not at all. I spake as a child. I responded to particular things. Paul really talking about spiritual truths, mysteries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't know, but I spoke anyway. He said, I understood. Well, how? As a child. And lastly, he said, I thought. Hmm? So what Paul is saying to us, that someone had to be a shepherd teacher. Then he says, but when I came up, now look at child and man. It means he's gone through an evolution. He is now what? Mature. Well, he was already a man when he was talking about being a child. He was not talking about his chronological age. Hmm? Now, as I say here at Bethany, if you inverse that, now he says, I no longer speak first, understand, and then think. He said, what now? I think before I say something. And now I understand it. Hmm? And then now I speak. Can we say praise the Lord? So this is a place of maturity. Not only that, but now maturity is when you listen and begin to understand something and you put it into practice. Acts chapter, what is it? Uh, 26, 11, is that it? Or is it 11, 26? They were first called, look what he says now. They were first called Christians at Antioch. That meant that Paul and his teacher companion spoke with them for over, what, a year? Was it two, three years? He spoke to them. And what happened? They now were called Christians. Isn't that something? They were now called Christians. It had to be a process. Now, he was talking about saints, but we have a tendency of interpreting Christian to mean what? Christ, Christ-like. I'm trying to finish this up real quick. And gave some uh, for the perfecting of the saint. Now, you have to be transformed before God can use you. We go through an evolution. We go through boot camp. We go through training. We have a lot of knocks and bruises, but what? We stay in the race. <laughs> can we say praise the Lord? Look what he says. For the work of what? For the work of the ministry. You're not going to send immature folks in the ministry. At least we shouldn't anyway. I'm not talking loud enough. And he says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now actually it's three things here that is uh, supposed to happen in sequence. Perfect means to mature. And then you prepare someone for what? For work. There has to be an orientation. I'm talking loud enough. And he says, for the work of the ministry, and that means what? Ministry means souls. 
he that went his souls is wise. The dear sister Evangelist, she would say yes, and he that keep his souls wiser. And lastly, he says this. He says, for the edifying of the body of what? We talked about the body in the above scriptures. For the edifying of the body of Christ. The word itself, edify, comes from a Greek word. And it means edifice. It means to build up. And how do we build the kingdom of God? We build it by lively stones. My, my, my. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus looked on the harvest and said, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. It's a strange thing that Jesus healed. He done miraculous things and told those, said, don't, don't you tell anybody. Don't you tell anybody. And these folks were so elated, they went out and told everybody. <laughs> And now we have a problem telling anybody. Hmm? What shall we say when we sit at the feet of Jesus Christ and have lost all the opportunities that he has set before us? Something the late Bishop Jester Purnell would say, if you take care of his business, he'll take care of your business. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. My, 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 my. For the perfecting of the saint. All of us have an assignment. We have a job to do, a job to finish. We get happy over Paul and as he tells Timothy, he said, Timothy, Look what he says now. He was talking about anybody else but himself. He said, I, I, I have fought. What are we fighting? He said, tell me that I have fought a good fight. My, my, my. All these years, Timothy, I've been fighting. Timothy, I have finished what? My course. I stayed with the syllabi that the Lord had given me. I finished my course. Oh, it's been hard and tedious. When you take opportunity to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, my, 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 my. I encourage you to do so, the latter part of chapter 11. I have finished my course. I've been shipwrecked. I've been stayed in the deep. I've been beaten. I'm, I've been left for dead. I've been shipwrecked. Oh, my. But I finished my course. I didn't deviate. Didn't slack up, didn't become tired or weary. And lastly, he made Timmy Timothy, I have finished what? Hmm? I finished my course, and what else? I have kept the faith. I hung in there. My brothers and sisters, those of you on social media, those on campus this evening, it's time for the child of God to grow up. It's time for us to be mature. All of these things that you hold so dear will mean nothing when it's your time to see the king. A time of reflecting on the time that you have left. Have you served the Lord with all of your heart? I'm not saying that challenges and difficulties and circumstances don't, will not come. But don't you think it's about time to give your life to Christ? I, I think, and you can certainly say, uh, Pastor, phrase that simply supposition. But I think because we don't do what Christ has told us to do, we suffer a lot of depression and anxiety and trepidation and stress. And Jesus Christ has given us the remedy. He says, cast all your cares upon him. And that means come to him in prayer. 
upon him, and it says he cares for you. This evening, we have just taken a few moments to discuss some of the scripture, and our main theme this evening was the perfecting the saint. We can never understand the Lord and what he does for us and what he has for us until we grow up. We have to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us. We got a race to run. We got souls that need to be saved. We got hearts that are simply wandering in a world, not understanding where they're going to end up. And most folks think when they die, they're going to heaven. But that's not according to the scripture. God has called you. He has saved you. He has enhoused you for a purpose. You can overcome. You can be a winner. You can be strong. Because you're more than a conqueror through him that loved us. This is coming from Bethany Apostolic Church located in the heart of the city of Evansville, Indiana. This is Bishop D.W. Frazier. And let me say this to you. Oh, we're going to try to work on a theme. I like saying this, and I think that it speaks volumes. And I think it will help you uh, in your walk with God. It will help him uh, and allow him to navigate you through life itself. It's not what's eating you. It's who's feeding you. Can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Ah, let us stand. Let us stand. Let us stand. Let us stand. We praise God for his loving kindness, his tender mercies. Lord, we thank you because you're God and God all alone. There is no test, there's no trial, there's no challenge that we cannot go through with you. Help us, O oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus, to step out of our own inhibitions. Help us to become vulnerable so that you can help us. O oh God, when you become Lord over our lives, life is bearable. And the words that you said, Lord, that my yoke is easy and my burden is light when we give ourselves to you. Help us, Lord, to grow up. Help us to grow up, Lord, that when you speak, you will say, here am I. That we understand, oh God, that you are perfecting us. That the tests and trials we go through is common to man, and we're able to bear it. Help us, oh God, to have another mindset when our fears come calamity come, help us simply to turn to you. Keep us, Lord, when we don't want to be kept. Hold us in your hands when we don't want to be held. Oh God, oh God, oh God, don't let us sabotage what you're trying to do for us. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Help us to go beyond nostalgia yes. yesterday, what used to be, yes. and realize that you're working with us in the here and the now. Yes. For these things we ask in that name of Jesus Christ, it never fails. As we leave this place, we pray, oh God, that you cover us and go with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Praise the Lord, everybody.